Well, hello and good morning, Meeting House family. My name is Steve Kerr. I am the pastor of the Meeting House uh, Sandbanks. We're a Meeting House community in Prince Edward County, uh, Ontario, and uh, I uh, have a beautiful wife, Whitney, and uh, two boys, Mason and Fanick. I think you're going to see a photo of them uh, up here. And uh, whether you are just joining us today for the first time, or if you have been with us for uh, a long time, I just want to welcome you this morning and say it's good to journey with you today. If you want to join into the conversation, you can join our Discord server or uh, on our live chat. Uh, I'll be there during the teaching today. And, uh, you know, we want to know more about you, our online community. For a few weeks now, we've had a live uh a live survey out. We just want to get to know who you are and where you are. It's a very simple survey. If you want to be a part of that and let us know who you are and where you are, we'd like to know how we can serve you better. So you can find the link down below and uh, check in there if you want to, to let us know who you are. Did you know that uh, the Meeting House turns 37 today? I know I should have a party hat on or a big sign, maybe a cake, but that'd be a lot for me alone here at home. But when I'm here at home and what I like to think about is just 37 years ago, a body of people started to gather as a community. <clears throat> Excuse me. They started to gather as a community. And now here we are today because they responded to the call that God gave them to honor that, to join together uh, in worship with him. And uh, today I want to invite you to give into that. Uh, giving and money is one of the things that Jesus talked about an awful lot uh, with us. And if you have, you know, received from God, if you've met Jesus here uh, in this space, in this community, I would like you to consider how you could give to support this so that other people can also meet Jesus. Um, we have a passage here I want to read just before I pray and send us off to worship uh, that I like to think about when I think about this community of believers that started the Meeting House 37 years ago, in 1 Peter 2, we read, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As you consider giving, you're a living stone. Your body is one of these things that God calls you to give into our community. So not just time, not just money. What is God calling you to give today? Let's pray together before we worship and hear from Quincy. Dear God, we are just so grateful to be able to come and spend time with you today. I hope that everyone here who, who's come experiences you in a real way today. We want to give thanks today for not just the 37 years of the Meeting House, but for all of time, all of your people who have stood hand in hand with you and who have shared that relationship with their children and with their children so that we today can stand in worship of you. I pray that you would encourage us to also go and share what we have learned, share this relationship we have with you with others so that other people can continue to worship you, continue to get to know you. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'll connect with you. Hello. We are so glad that you've joined us today. We'd love to invite you to join us now as we sing together. Our voices united together, lifting up the name of the Lord. If you'd like to stand with us. Nothing better. 
better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not
I was doing a little reading on the song story of this next song that we're going to be doing, and the author, one of the things he wanted to get across was, not only do we serve a God who is a covenant maker, but we serve a God who is a covenant, a covenant keeper. And um, one of the lines of this song that really stands out to me, it says, let my heart learn. When you speak a word, it will come to pass. That's the word that really jumps out to me today. And there's some examples in this song of other uh, biblical examples of, of that faith and a moving forward with God in a covenant. So let's sing these words together.
the Lord, am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, you must be holy, because I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. Of all the religions in the world, perhaps the religion of liberty is the only faith capable of purity. Tiffany Madison. Without love, even the most radical devotion to God is of no value to him. You can gain all the spiritual gifts in the world. You can take the most radical steps of obedience. You can share every meal with the homeless in your city. You can memorize the book of Leviticus. You can pray each morning for four hours like Martin Luther. But if what you do does not flow out of a heart of love, a heart that does those things because it genuinely desires to do them, it is ultimately worthless to God. J. D. Greer. If you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. Leviticus, chapter 18, verse five. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third week in our series on Leviticus, where we're talking about food and childbirth and bodily discharge and skin disease, and my favorite mold. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Man alive. This is going to be something, and, uh, and I'm glad that you're here for this. I, I, I hope that you've experienced in, in similar ways that I have, is that this has not been the series that I've actually expected, that there's been some good things hidden in this old uh, ancient text that we find the third book of the, of the Old Testament. If you've ever ventured at the beginning of the year and felt ambitious enough to say, okay, I'm going to start this year and I'm going to read through the entire Bible, and you go online and you find one of those, the read the Bible in an entire year uh, programs, it takes about a month before you hit that proverbial brick wall. And uh, the first two books you get, you know, Genesis, yeah, it's a story of the creation and Adam and Eve and and the snake, and then there's Noah and the flood, and, and there's all of these exciting things that are happening. Then Exodus, oh man, it's like, you know, uh, Egypt, and let my people go, and the, the ten plagues and everything, and it's, okay, I can, this is some, there's something happening here, and then all of a sudden you hit this book that we're, we've been in now two weeks, the third week now, Leviticus, and say, like, what is this? Like, what have we, what have we stumbled upon uh, now in our time of Bible reading? 
and, and I struggle with this book. I think out of all of the books of the Bible, this is probably the one that I struggle with the most. And I think partly the reason for that is because it doesn't read like a, like a story. It doesn't have a, a narrative flow to it. This is okay, this happened and then that happened and then different characters and a, and a plot, so to speak. But it's really, um, as we've learned in the last couple of weeks, it's a, it's a priestly manual of instructions that are uh, very detailed, very specific, very repetitive. If you've ever gone through, it's the same kind of thing read over and over and over again. And it's, um, it just seems ancient. There's so many things that just, how does, how does this apply to where I am now in my current state? How does this apply to us living in the 21st century Western civilization? What are, what are the connections? And my hope is that, that we can spend a little time figuring out uh, who this, uh, this book and this text was written to in order to gain context and say, okay, this is how it applies in our life. There are some passages of scripture, you can read them right off the bat and say, okay, this applies to me and, and this is the way it applies to me. And it's very easy, it's very kind of um, matter of fact. You'll get some benefit, but not nearly as much benefit if you actually spend time in getting to know the context of what's happening. And, and Jimmy's done a great job in the last two weeks of bringing us context. But I think it's so important that it's worth actually doing again to say, okay, so let's, let's get an idea of really what's happening, who this, uh, this text is written to, so that I may be able to get an idea of how this might apply to me. The, the expression that was used the last two weeks is let's, let's approach the text in a sympathetic way, right? Understanding uh, who, who this is for so that we can um, engage in that way. I also appreciated the, the invitation that Jimmy gave to us to, to, to be able to be open to what God may have for us to receive. There's got to be a reason that this text is endured the length of time that it has, maybe there's something for us to receive. And as we receive that, whatever it may be from, from God or Holy Spirit, from Jesus, like from you know, our, our imaginations, to then ask the question of how then should I respond? If I've, if I've received something, then how can I now respond to what's been happening? So let's, let's do a little bit of, of rewind. And starting with this group of uh, people known as the children of Israel, or the Israelites, started off as a large extended family of about 70 people who left their land originally because of famine and found themselves in the land of Egypt. And during that time of Egypt, the text says in, in Exodus that they grew and multiplied so much, to the, so much to the extent that the king of the time said that this group of people actually could potentially be a, a significant threat to our nation and our way of life. So they ended up getting put into the, the situation or the bondage of slavery in order to kind of keep them at bay. So Egypt would have had a, a stable food supply, a, a sophisticated hierarchy, a, a social structure, a, a government. Um, it would have advances in technology. But what would simultaneously be running at the core of this empire, of the things that are happening in Egypt, would be this idea of fear and greed as motivators. Oppression and exploitation would be, would be moving uh, freely. And especially uh, for those that are at the bottom of the of the social structure. Those that are at the bottom would be experiencing kind of a hopeless crushing, a hopelessness and a, and a crushing experience with a, with a knowledge that every single day would be exactly like the day that came before it. And that in this, in this culture, your value would directly be connected to how much you're able to produce. In the Israelites' case, they were producing bricks primarily. So your value would directly be con uh, connected to, to how much you can make. 
a way of living that uses people as tools to build and to extend kingdom and empire. And along with infrastructure and social constructs would be a kind of belief of a religious system. And most would have gods that represented the different spaces and aspects that were crucial for survival, like, like a god of, of rain or sun or fertility or, because the ancient world in many ways was more connected with reality than, than we are in our time today and that they came to grips with it. They really have little control of what's going on in this world. We think that we have control. We have the illusion of control, but really uh, the, the, the ancient world knew that they had very little control, so, so this is how it kind of manifested in its, in its uh, religious system. And the question would always be, how do we keep these angry gods on our side? And the question that would ever be present was, where do I stand with these gods? Which would lead to a constant and perpetual state of anxiety that somewhere, someone or something just needs more. I don't know if I'm producing enough. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know where I, where I, write, I quite stand with the gods. And this book of Leviticus starts with a holy God accommodating his people and says, you don't have to guess where you stand with me. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to be as specific and direct as I can. And I want you to know that you are and can be in good standing with me. He says, you are valuable. The God of Israel says, I want to get closer to you. Currently, the children of Israel would be, would be meeting through the one mediator, which would be Moses, at the top of the mountain. And then plans would be made and, and directions would be made that, for the, the presence of God to come from the mountaintop down into the camp where the people are. I want to close the gap and the distance that's, that exists between us. So this is step one. This is like uh, basic training. Uh, this is uh, the learning to walk and talk and the unlearning of the culture that they've just come from. The story of the Exodus, the story of the children of Israel being taken out of Egypt is filled with miracles. It's amazing. I think they, they made a movie about it, I think. Ten Commandments. It's, yeah, coming close to Easter, or watch it. Full confession, I've still, I've yet to see the Ten Commandments, which is... I heard, I heard people gasp just there for a moment. Really, is that? Maybe this Easter will be the, every year I say, I should watch it, I really should watch it. But anyway, it hasn't happened, I probably will. Amazing. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's shocking, I hear you like. But, it, but it's, it's, it's filled with all of these miracles where the God of Israel goes like, like uh, one-on-one with all of the, uh, the, the so-called gods of Egypt and dismantles them in a way that's just incredible. But it's, it's, it's fantastic. But as difficult and as pronounced as that is, the children of Israel moving from Egypt, the Hebrews being taken out of this empire, even more difficult, or the work that's still to come in a significant way is that the Egypt or the empire is taken out of the children of Israel. That actually is the more difficult work. The miracle of, of the Exodus happens and it's there and you can't deny it, you sing songs about it, but what, you, what we find in, in the story of the Old Testament and even in our own experience is that, that pull and that call towards empire and fear and greed and using people as objects and all of these kinds of principles are the things that we, we keep getting drawn to and need to, be, uh, to ask constantly for God to remove them from us. And uh, last week we left off Jimmy talking about the, the sons of Aaron who violate the specific instructions that God gives to them. And that uh, two of the four sons get consumed by the power and presence of God. And now uh, after that experience, there's mourning, there's been a defilement of the, of the, the holy place. 
I think the analogy used uh, last week was this is as if there was a wedding ceremony and somebody comes from the back and pushes over the, the priest and knocks down the bride and groom and starts to do their own thing. There's, there's been a, a, a sacred thing that's happening and then there was a, a defilement or a total disregard. And God now sets out even more instructions on clarity. Okay, we're gonna make things very clear for you about holiness, about what is common, about what is pure and about what is impure. So we'll start um, quickly just to look at the difference between what is holy and what is common. And, and the first thing is holiness. Like what is it? We hear this as, a, as an ideal or a picture of, of maybe even perfection, but a, a good explanation or a way to define it is holiness is the being set apart. It's being in the presence of and in the service of God. That to, to strive towards holiness is about a proximity with God, a partnership with God, and a meaningful connection. The Hebrew word is kadosh, to be holy. It's a, a person, place, or thing that has been brought into proximity of the Most High God for his service. And this idea of holiness refers to the, the unique, one-of-a-kind status of Yahweh, who is the source of all life, all goodness, and all things perfect. This is the Holy One, the I Am, the, the, the holy, 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 as the angels proclaim as they, they sing God's praises. And this holy God, in his generosity, creates us with a very unique and beautiful opportunity for us to be able to have communion with himself. We're the common. There's either holy or there's common. And to, to, to be common is, is not to be bad, it's just, it's just to be anything but God. So a, a chair or um, a jacket, uh, a phone, myself, you, we're all common. We fall into that category. So everything being common, it's, it's more or less a starting point for us. It's not good or bad, but it's a, it's a place of starting. And within the state of being common, uh, you have two distinctions. So you have holy and you have common. And within common, you have two distinctions. You have either, either pure or, or clean or well or whole or healthy. And then you have impure to be unclean or, or sick or not well. And for the Israelite to be in a common state that is pure simply means that you are welcome to be in God's holy presence. But what is really, really important to remember and to understand is that to be impure or to be unclean is not synonymous with being evil or bad. There are moral and ethical issues, obviously, that are not good ways of living, but, but what we're talking about this morning are ritualistic means of impurity. Things that happen in the course of a, of a lifetime that aren't bad or aren't sinful or don't need your repentance, but just a matter of living in this world that's, that's corrupt and broken and, uh, and incomplete. And the ritual, uh, ritualistic impurity is any sign of death, decay, and a reminder that we are no longer living in Eden. What's very important to, to note is that it means that impurity is a state of being that cannot be in the presence of God until you have gone through a period or a, a process of cleansing. We talked about holiness being in the proximity of God and impurity uh, has to do with being in the proximity of death. So uh, an example might be if you're preparing for heart surgery or you're, you're, you're imagining a scene of somebody preparing for heart surgery and you see the operating room and you see the table and you see the surgical instruments that have been prepared and cleaned and then you see the, the, the table there, you see well, a well-lit area, everything is clean. You wouldn't expect to see a, a nurse or a doctor eating a bag of potato chips, right? That would seem like, an, like an, a, 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 a thing that's going on that doesn't quite fit in the space. 
I will testify here, there is nothing evil or wicked about potato chips. No way, shape, or form. But to have that um, object in a place that doesn't really belong, where the consequences are dire, if the situation is not sterile, if the place is not taken care of well, the, 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 the ramifications could be very significant. So this holiness is kind of um, a spiritual example of that. And after the defilement in the temple by the, by the sons of Aaron, God now has to be very specific on, okay, this is what belongs in and this is what belongs out. And chapter 11 is about to make a move from life in the sacred place to the life of us in our bodies in a very personal way. We're the children of Israel. In chapter 11, we look at food. Chapter 12, we're looking at uh, childbirth. Chapters 13 and 14 is talking about conditions and things for, for skin, uh, skin disease and mold. Everybody's favorite, uh, chapter 15 of bodily discharges. Uh, this is, gets, it's, um, it's kind of icky what, uh, where, we're, where we're headed. But hopefully we'll be able to see how these things are connected. And first, the, uh, the food laws. And the instructions involve the way that people bring sustenance and life to their own bodies. So every single day at every meal, there's an opportunity for you to be reminded of God based on what you eat and what you don't eat. So baked right into our daily rhythm or the daily rhythm of the, of the children of Israel, there's an opportunity for them to recognize, oh, God is in this place. Very important to not have uh, blood within uh, any of the meat that they consume. If it is going to be a land animal, you know that it can't uh, chew cud or um, have a cloven hoof. And there's great detail in that. It says, okay, so, so, you, can, so you can have something that, uh, that, you can only have something that chews its own cud or has a cloven hoof, which is a very specific distinction. Seems very random. And then it gets into the, the animals or the creatures of the sea. And it says it has to have fins or scales in order for it to be good for you to eat. If it's a bird and, 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 and is in the air, then it can only, um, it, can, it can't be a bird of prey, prey. It can't be something that eats the flesh of other animals. And the distinctions are, are very interesting. And, and at the very surface, at a very basic level, this has some, maybe some dietary or, or some health uh, benefits where these are people that are completely out in the wilderness. Um, consider this like a, uh, a massive camping uh, expedition for people who have never been camping before. And, and just being able to have some distinctions between what's good to eat and what's not good to eat, where you can save yourself from, from disease, is actually a really good thing. There's another um, couple theories from, from scholars that have looked at this book, maybe other possibilities of what's going on here, just besides just a basic hygienic or a clean way of, of pursuing, that some of the animals that are there that are mentioned are, are actually vul in states of vulnerability, higher states of vulnerability than others, like those that, that are in the bottom of the ocean that can't swim or freely move around are, are susceptible to, to other predators. And, and, and it's quite possible that God is trying to tell his people no, we don't want you to be a, a predatory kind of people. That's, that's empire way. I wa we want you to be a people that, that actually allows the vulnerable to survive and to, and to thrive. You don't have to eat this. And other, other schools of thought, they say, no, no, no. Um, part of the distinctions is actually God just saying, all of your neighbors eat this stuff, and I don't want you to eat it. I just want you to, to put something aside the culture of empire says, if something is available to me, I'm gonna take it. If something can be eaten, I will eat it. That everything around exists for my use, for my pleasure, for my benefit and somehow. And God, by making these distinctions, is saying, no. Maybe the best, the, the, the way that the best version of yourself gets put into play is by you saying no to some things from time to time. That not everything is beneficial. Things maybe need to be set aside. There's something here for us. The don't eat this, the eat this. This new kingdom is saying maybe showing restraint is good. Denial could be necessary in order for us to live a righteous life. 
In the next chapter, chapters 12 and 15, we get into this one. These two are very difficult for me as I, as I work with it. They're tricky. We're talking about childbirth, and uh, we'll put bodily discharge in there as well. They kind of go together, and maybe hopefully you'll see soon in a bit. I don't know. It's maybe a stretch. But, um, but this one is, is another shift is happening from the outside of our body, what we consume, to what's actually happening inside of our body, uh, nat- natural occurrences. And childbirth especially is cause for celebration. Yet at the beginning it says that if there is, when childbirth happens, then it puts the mother and the child in a state of impurity. Even longer in the case if if the the child that's born is 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 a girl child as opposed to a boy, which is another one. Like, I don't get that. Like, why is that even there? But childbirth is, is a cause for celebration and a good time to be reminded that impurity doesn't mean bad or sinful, but they're natural parts of life because every culture holds childbirth with a sense of both awe and anxiety. So that there are laws around this specific act aren't unique to, to the Israelites. It would be everywhere in the ancient world. But that practices or provisions made around childbirth are of universal interest. And although this is a very, at this time, is very much a male-dominated society, it shouldn't be assumed that the length of the ceremonial uncleanliness is connected to value. But it's very likely connected to a kind of recognition of vulnerability. For both a child and its mother, the chance of, lo- the chance of losing life is very, very high. And this God... Not the, not the Egyptian gods, but this God is on the side of life and in the preservation of life. Because during the miraculous event of childbirth, the threat of death is at an all-time high. And from other parts of Scripture, we know that this God places high value on blood. With Cain and Abel, with the conversations with Noah, where it says, don't eat any, any meat with blood in it. That blood somehow is, is connected deeply and synonymous with life. So the loss of blood, whenever, whenever what is inside the body we find outside the body, God is saying, pay attention. That there's an extra heightened sense of awareness of, of the, the, the threshold or the distance between death and life. It's, it's very thin right now. So recognize this as a, as a sacred moment of something spiritual that is in the midst that's, that's happening. Very similar to to the bodily discharges that happen. For the, it talks about a woman's monthly, uh, monthly cycle or uh, my favorite, uh, nocturnal emissions from a man, which is something different that we won't get into this morning. But this idea of, of, uh, of, of life liquids, for lack of a better expression, that, that are inside the body and function as either uh, sustaining life or creating life, when they are outside of the body, God is saying, pay attention. When life is leaking, pay attention and set yourself apart for a time. This isn't wrong, it's not sinful, but this is God emphasizing the sanctity, the preciousness of life. And in chapter 13 and 14, we have more detail where we've gone from, from what goes in your body to, to, to what comes out of your body, and now just the, the skin of your body, where your body lives, and then even your home, where, where that body resides. And this one is a little more straightforward as it deals with kind of these practical safety uh, tips. Anytime there's a skin disease, this person who has this needs to go to the priest for examination, a time of quarantine and then re-examination. And this concept may be the least foreign to us in what we've experienced in COVID. And that if you have exposure to somebody, you may not necessarily have the virus, but there's a protocol that has to happen or needs to happen in order to keep other people safe, right? Like, so if you're, you're in contact with somebody who may be infected, the rule is, or the, the idea is, you, there's some sort of purification, you wash your hands and you separate for a while, and then after that separation has happened, then you come back and get re-examined. And in this case, it would be by the priest. So a very similar process that we find ourselves going through over the past two years. 
Because in, in the ancient time of, of Israel, even the proximity of being around something uh, that is impure could uh, actually render you as being impure. Just the proximity of something that may be uh, threatening of life or an example of life leaking is a reason to separate for a time and then to come back for reconnection. See, the, the way of empire wouldn't have time for all of those steps. Empire would say, did somebody just cough? Was that a sneeze? Yeah, dead, out. <laughs> we can't afford you infecting the rest of our labor force, so we need to get you out. So this way of approaching things is saying, no, 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 no. Anytime there's any kind of impurity, there's an imbalance, we want to say, no, no, no. We want to take it serious, but out of love for you as an individual, out of love for us as a community, the time is to go, to heal, to clean, and then to come back. The heart of this instruction was never to shame or to ostracize, but to follow a procedure that would make it good for the person to be uh, re-engaged. And remember where they're coming from. It's like you produce or you're not useful. When these practices are saying no, stop. Separate for a time so that after that time we can all become whole once again. And as these practices continued, it was clear that the heart began to drift back to empire. During Jesus' time, those that were, were put aside for, for purity, say, were seen as less than or invaluable or somehow corrupt and filthy and awful. That was never the heart. That was never God's intention. But the shift now where we look at people more as things and objects or tools for our own benefit began to shift back to, back to Egypt. Egypt kept kind of creeping back in the hearts of the people. Where those that were outside were uh, unclean. Don't come near to me. You know the story of the Good Samaritan where the religious folks would, would cross the, the, the road when they saw the person who was bleeding and, and in um, need of help. Because anyhow, they would come in contact with something that was uh, connected to or resembled any, any semblance of death they had to remove themselves from. And what's mind-blowing is that Jesus comes and he sees this shift. He sees that the, those that are sick or considered impure or seen as evil and sinful are, what did you do to offend the gods? Another uh, Egyptian way of thinking, uh, not a God way of thinking. What did you do to offend the gods? You must be not right with him. No, 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 no. That's not it at all. And even the priests were seeing themselves not just as set apart, as shoulder to shoulder, as brothers in this, this, this journey towards closeness to God, but they were seeing themselves as not just separate, but above. The priests saw themselves as being better than, which was a drift back into this, this, uh, this, uh, dangerous hierarchy. And when we see Jesus step on the scene, he comes in a very uh, different counter-cultural way. Again, he's reminding the people where any proximity to death or sickness or illness would render you unclean. And Jesus comes into every one of those places. Look, the Gospel of Luke, if you look through it and, and, and pay attention to each one of the healing uh, stories that happened in Luke's Gospel, it's almost like, and Luke's a doctor, by the way, which is kind of interesting, but Luke's very specific. It's like, no, no, Jesus went to this person who had leprosy and touched them. By default, would make him ceremonially unclean. He's connected with death, but Jesus goes and touches them. This person is dead. He goes and he touches death. He goes in a home of where they wouldn't be eating kosher. Jesus engages in that, which, which puts him in a different category altogether. He's beyond just common and pure, corruptible, but a holy, a holiness that can't be corrupted, but goes into places of impurity and brokenness and dysfunction and defilement and makes those spaces clean.
I, I appreciate and, and learning to appreciate so much more this gift that is uh, the book of Leviticus is giving a perspective of, of a starting place. Ah, okay. The work of Jesus now is actually so much more significant to me as I, as I look through and see what he's done and accomplished. Jesus engages with us in our brokenness and our impurities and our dysfunction and says, I will make you whole. Don't fall in the ways of empire and, of, and, and the, the thinking of Egypt to say that you have no idea where you stand with me. You can know I'm close. It is good. I love you. You have value. And I can make you whole. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the gift that you've given us, for the opportunity to be drawn into your presence. We pray, Father, that you would uh, help remove um, the things that are in us that are of the old way and replace them with your beauty and your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
How beautiful. We don't have to wait. We don't have a long process to become holy. We can meet Jesus today. It can be built right into our rhythm. It was built right into the rhythm of the Israelites and their lifestyle so they knew. So they could remember that they were set apart. You can remember that you are set apart. How can you remember? In this month of Easter leading up, we're participating in a month-long uh, month of prayer. Uh, the prayer guide is available at themeetinghouse.com slash prayer guide. Uh, this week, uh, we're looking at how to incorporate your body into that prayer. And that's just so beautiful, uh, your body being a temple, a place where Jesus wants to meet you. Uh, if you haven't joined in there, I hope you can download that, week, that this week and join in with us. Uh, also, you could participate in the Discord conversation, go deeper. Maybe you had some questions from the teaching today. Send them in at ask at themeetinghouse.com. And if you're not plugged into a community, why not join one of our home churches and get to know a few more people, talk a little bit about what you heard, how God met you today, and how that's going to change your life moving forward. I hope you have a great week. Until next time, we bless you. Thank you.